Hello and welcome to Music Ally Focus with me, Music Ally's editor, Joe Sparrow. And in this episode, we're extremely pleased to welcome Richard Gotterer, co-founder of the first digital distributor, The Orchard, to the show. The reason he's here today is to discuss The Orchard's 25th anniversary and talk about what he's learned along the way and what the future holds for digital distribution. Now, what is this Focus podcast? Well, Music Ally, as you know, provides an analysis-rich and contextual guide to the biz, and each Focus episode analyzes one meaningful music business story at a time, just like this one. And this podcast is also going to be, as ever, quick. It should take about the same amount of time as Wang Lei could theoretically cut in half 625 apples with a chainsaw whilst they were being held in the mouth of fellow daredevil Wang Xinli. Uh, Wang Lei chopped 25 apples that, as a reminder, were being held in Wang Xinli's mouth in half in one minute in 2020. And if you have any kind of nervous disposition whatsoever, don't go and watch that video. Uh, Now, talking of making a noise and chopping and changing, Richard Gotterer is a man with a rich history of varied activity and success in the music industry. And here's the very short version of that. Starting as a successful songwriter, he went on to form Sire Records with Seymour Stein and produced albums by Blondie, The Go-Go's and Dr. Feelgood along the way. In 1997, he co-founded The Orchard, the first digital distributor of music, with Scott Cohen, who is now Chief Innovation Officer at Warner Music Group. Uh, The Orchard is now a subsidiary of Sony Music, and it's celebrating its 25th anniversary. Now, that's a long time. It's a quarter of a century. So we wanted to talk to Richard uh, about what he has learned along the way and how it connects back to his beginnings as a songwriter when he was only 15 years old. So let's go over to Richard now and find out more. Okay, Richard, welcome to the podcast. Now, we're going to chat to you a little bit about a quarter of a century of uh, running the orchard <laughs> and looking back <laughs> at what uh, uh, you've, you've learned over that time and what you think is happening now and with all the um, the experience of that. But, but before we get started on that, you are a man with a rich background in music as well. And, and this is a question I've started asking people right at the beginning, to put some context in, which is, is there a favorite piece of music that you have, if you could only take one? I think I go back to soul music somewhere. You know, uh, that era really, um, really uh, fascinated me. If I had a single, I would say maybe a Sam Cooke song. Uh, well, that was a golden era, wasn't it? Yeah, you know, it was. That was but uh, really so, fabulous time. Sam Cooke was prior to the period of, Otis Redding, and um, mm. I would say as recordings, because I I loved recordings and model recordings. So I would say when a man loves a woman, or to tell you yeah. the truth, they go back into Louis Jordan. I mean, that kind of stuff where the roots come through. Um, I like that. And as far as music goes, I mean, Howlin' Wolf, uh, blues, which is where I... Right started and learned that as a kid there were only four songs and i could write songs and right because of course you you did start as a songwriter before you yeah. co-founded sire and became a producer and then the orchard after that let's go back to when you started orchard then and see if we can join the dots between your love of music and and, and what you're doing at the orchard sure. you know, a quarter of a century is is a substantial amount of time Especially when you started at the innovation point, um, when of being the first digital distributor of music. So, when you look back at that starting period, twenty five years ago, what's the one or over that period? What's the one thing that sort of sticks in your mind about being at the helm of the company? Yeah, at that time, um, it was basically Scott and myself, uh, Scott Cohen, myself, and some interns and one or two other people that were friends of ours that, um, uh, that worked with us. And um, what, what sticks in my mind is we had a big computer that we used because we had a small record company called Soul 3. And it was through the usage of that and trying to promote the records we had on the label that we discovered there were stores on the internet. And the stores on the internet sold physical CDs, but essentially mail order. And there were no independent artists on it. It was almost all um, major label. 
or record label artists. And that sticks in my mind because that's what prompted Scott and I to say, wait a minute, something's missing here. And, you know, as we observed then, the point they made was that technology is now making it available for independent artists to have their music within a system where people could find it and buy it. Although there are only a few stores, Amazon hadn't even started selling music at the time. They were just selling books. Um, and it prompted Scott and I to move ahead, find out what the source was for these stores and um, convince them that we could deliver all the independent music in the world to them, which of course we had not one artist at the time we proposed it. So what was that process like then? You, 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 you pitched this idea, you say, hey, yeah, sure, you know, you're missing uh, you know, what is reasonably a substantial amount of the, the market. Uh, and then right. we're going to go get it and bring it to you. So what was that bit like? Yeah, well, we went out to the place that supplied it and went to talk to them about it and presented him with what we thought was a really great progressive idea. And here's where we wind back to the beginnings, which is really what they were interested in talking to me about. What was it like at CBGB's? Right. <laughs> what was Blondie really like? <laughs> what, the Go-Go's, did they play their instruments? You know, all this. And um, what the point of it is that the things you do that add credibility to you in the past, pay dividends in the present and the future, and not just financial dividends. But, um, but they they felt that we weren't usurpers trying to come into their space, but that we were people that were part of a business they loved, and we were trustworthy. Um, and they made us the exclusive providers to the internet stores that they supplied. And from there, we became distributors. And the that's the birth of the orchard. It's pretty simple. And it was basically physical. But we sat around and we would think, well, okay, technology can't really stop just with slow internet speeds. We realized that um, just as CDs came along and were digital, there would be another digital explosion. And when we, um, when we signed an affiliation agreement with the artists to distribute their music into the stores through the orchard, we inserted a paragraph in the agreement that you also give us the right uh, to deliver your music digitally. Well, there really wasn't any place to deliver it. However, yeah. we anticipated that it was coming. And most people looked at it and said, what is that? I said, well, this is so at one point you're going to be able to download files of music and we will supply that as we're supplying your physical as well. Don't worry. We're going to continue supplying your physical. And um, people <clears throat> agreed to sign on to it uh, because there was nothing to lose. So back in those early days, you, obviously you sort of foresaw this this future of streaming or digital consumption, we, I think you know in the late nineties is when we maybe first saw some of the very first experiments with with streaming music oh, yeah. or, or at least providing it for download. We we sort of look back now at the music industry in in a very broad sense and say, well, you know, you you, you didn't see that coming and you missed the boat and then it took you a while to recover. Well, is that really what it was like? Did you see resistance to the idea or people embracing it? Uh no. Um... I think for the most part, if you take um, major labels, for example, you know, you had mp3.com, you had Napster, you know, which was a threat to their system. But as soon as Apple, which was at that time, a uh, billion dollars was a lot of money, uh, not any longer, but, but um, Apple came into play and they said, well, look, we're gonna offer downloads of your songs, we won't compete with your physical. And you know what? We'll pay you exactly the same as you get, and they sell them for in a record store. 
which is very smart. Yeah. And at that point, we finally took in investment and we were able to expand from just independent artists with physical CDs, but expand into the real digital space and go after the labels around the world as well. So at that point, I stopped being CEO and became chairman and a new CEO was put in and the investors really ran the business end of the company while Scott and I traveled the world and spoke to people about the significance, importance of what was coming and also sought out partners in different countries. We went to Australia, we went to Singapore, we went to China. We, we now have offices that are strictly orchard offices, not Sony orchard, but orchard offices in 45 different cities around the world. The concept for Scott and I was no matter what happens, let's make this global. It's got to be an entity that fulfills the, the needs for independent artists and independent labels on a global basis. Right. I was going to ask you, is, was that because you, you were sort of uh, so ambitious or was it because you just saw the nature of the business was global? Once we took in the investment and we were able to deal with labels, we were, we were acquiring distribution rights for labels from France, from India, from, you know, for Scott. And the other thing with Scott and I, we would, um, we went and we made a deal in Turkey uh, because there are a lot of Turkish people in Germany. And it was that concept where you could take the uh, diaspora, you could take, you could, you could, fo you could not focus, but you know, you could put Turkish music out in Germany or Chinese music in the United States. Uh, mm -hmm. And then years later, along comes a band that's singing in Korean that mm -hmm. we uh, helped break, contributed to breaking. Yeah and discovered through the orchard of uh, BTS. They're no longer with us, but the point is that's an example of what the concept was in the first place, that you could take music from one place and you could make it available and sell it in myriad other places. And is there something, you know, as you look back, has something sort of surprised you about either something that has happened during that growth an, an expansion or something that hasn't happened? Did something deviate quite a lot from the way you thought it was going to go? I, I had a feeling that uh, music would be offered as a sort of free commodity when you got your, well, they tried some of the, the British um, phone company would attach music as a benefit for signing up with them, your services. Uh, gas at the pump, you get music and maybe you pay five cents, two cents a gallon more. I don't know. But whatever it was, I thought it would be within a bubble. As it turned out, um, someone smart enough came along beside Apple. Uh, well, Amazon, everybody went into that moment. Then Spotify came along and um, and became the jukebox in the sky. It's it's really pretty amazing um, within a 25 year period, which is a relatively short term in history. Uh, you have to remember the music business essentially started in the early 1900s as a furniture business. The phonograph or the crank up machine, they made discs to sell more furniture. That was a piece of furniture. Um, and then along comes radio. You know, think it's going to put everyone else had a business, but no, it enhanced the business. I, I'm not even saying we guessed right. I think we, we got into a good position, Scott and I. We were lucky that things went the way we anticipated. Uh, and the company um, su succeeded. And to jump in here, if you're finding this useful and you'd like more of this kind of in-depth news or trusted analysis waiting for you in your inbox every morning, as well as access to all of our industry-leading reports, 
head on over to musically.com slash subscribe. As ever, if you do work for an indie label, you're an artist manager, you're an employee of a CMO or publisher, you might be eligible for one of our sponsored complimentary subscriptions as well. So head on over to musically.com slash subscribe to find out more. And now let's go back to Richard. You, you mentioned at the beginning that when you were approaching people initially, you, you were going to them and they were able to see that you were sort of um, not there to disrupt their business, but to augment it with, with, with what you were providing. 25 years later, the roles of all the different businesses in the music industry, you know, labels, publishers, whatever, they've all recalibrated a little bit, mm-hmm. right? Or, or in, to some of them quite substantially. And a distributor now is a to depending on which one you use an art, as an artist is a, a very multifaceted international company that can do lots of different things. So, what is the what is the position of a distributor in the in the music industry today? I mean, obviously, artists can post their music on these sites themselves. What makes the Orchard valuable is the offices in 45 cities, the fact that we can coordinate a global release. There's no guarantee of success. There never was any. But the important thing is today, the artist, whether it's individually through a label, has access. And that was the purpose of The Orchard in the first place, was to give independent artists access. You can't guarantee anything. But access. And we just improved the access points over and over and over again until it got to the point where we, in some cases, actually might be able to do something to enhance the work. Artists are, when they're emerging, they're quite savvy. They understand the system a little bit better, perhaps, than artists emerging did in the past because information is readily available to them. And what they're looking for, or one of the things a lot of them are looking for, is a level of control, a different level of control, where they perhaps have direct relationships with the individual companies in the value chain, uh, but also d- with fans, you know, they, and they yeah. want to own that relationship. <clears throat> how has that been reflected in in how The Orchard works with artists? I, I know you do a lot of work directly with labels, but you know, the artist services, for instance, what, what do they come to you and say that they're looking for? I think the big thing with with artists today is they don't, want their content their, their music owned by a company they want to they want to maintain their own rights ongoing to it and i think that's absolutely that's absolutely fine if they do all the creative work and 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 deliver the finished content but when when you when you contribute to the creation of the work um i think then the company has has a right to 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 ownership. A lot of the songs that we used to write in the brew building days, you know, we were kids, we were songwriters, and those songs would then be covered around the world. Today, most artists, it's an expression. What you write is an expression of yourself and brings you closer to your fan because you're telling them something about yourself. It's, it's interesting that the individual out there is not as influenced by promotion, marketing, um, um, payola, uh, as, as they used to be. They really want to know what the artist is about. They want, they, want, they want to feel that the artist is talking to them. And I think that's what makes great successful artists. You see it, that have engagement with their fans. You know, and also as an artist, uh, you have to, you, you don't think you can do it all yourself. There are people there that could be helpful. Uh, find the right person. And the right person for you might be different than the right person for somebody else. I've, I've never been one that, that believed um, you do any of these things in the music business, quote, to make money. <laughs> you do things that are great and successful because you did them and you feel good about it. The profit is the byproduct and the end result of doing all those things well. But 
having success is in the doing of it. And the, the actual financial profit that we all need comes from doing it well and other people recognizing it. With that in mind, with that sort of sense of perspective, is there something you would have told yourself when you started The Orchard that you, you've, you've learned subsequently? If you could give yourself then a really good piece of advice about what was going to happen in the next 25 years. Nah, you know, I, I think, I don't know what Scott would say, but, but for me, I would just say that it's amazing that 25 years later, I'm sitting here talking to you about something that we discovered by accident. <laughs> um, to, we may seem smart now, but we discovered it by accident in, a, in pursuit of trying to do something for the records we had out. We anticipated something that was to come and by virtue of that, we basically, by whatever means, we survived. I guess it was by belief, um, hard work, um, doing whatever manipulations we did till we got into a position where what we envisioned, meaning digital, um, um, downloading, streaming, um, came to pass. So when I look back on 25 years, I would say, whoa, what a great ride. But then I'll look back, I'll look back and say, well, I could go back nearly 60 plus years when I wrote my first song that was, I finally wrote it on a piano and I wrote it thinking of Jerry Lee Lewis and he actually recorded it, a song called I'm on Fire. and. From that song, from that very first day when I was 15 years old until today with The Orchard is the preeminent digital distributor uh, and essentially a, a music company in the world. It's one stream. I don't see it as different things. I, I went into it to do it. And I did it when I was 15, and now I will be on that. And uh, I'm so proud of The Orchard and so proud of Sony for the way they recognized and understand and understood how important The Orchard is uh, to them. And they continue to allow us to grow together uh, in an independent way. And that's the important thing is how do you support independent music? And uh, how do you support independent artists? And that's what the Orchard started as. That's what the Orchard has always done. And that's what it does today and will do in the future. Well, there we go. On that note, congratulations for the 25 years. And uh, thank you for joining yeah. us. Uh, great to join the dots all the way back to the beginning, as we, as we hope to do. I guess, yeah, it's uh, it's quite a uh, it's quite a trip, you know. I mean, as uh, Jerry Garcia would say, "What a long, strange trip it's been," <laughs> but it's a good one, and uh, I'm blessed to have been part of it. Thanks, Richard. Okay, Joe, thanks a lot. Nice talking to you. So, thanks again to Richard for joining us, and well, going back quite a long way and connecting all the dots in his career and explaining what he learned. If you found that useful. Please do share it on with someone else who you think will get something out of it. And if you'd like to get in touch with me, please do. It's joe, J-O-E, at musically.com. Don't forget we have a free weekly email that comes out every Friday called The Knowledge, which rounds up a soupçon of all the best analysis, news, marketing insight, and skills that Music Ally publishes, which is to say a lot. So sign up and you will instantly, and this is a guarantee, become a better, happier person. Links are in the description as ever. So that's it. Thank you for joining us, as always, here on the Music Ally Focus podcast. I've been Joe Sparrow, Music Ally's editor. Until next time, farewell. <laughs>